Welcome to Horror Movie Classics, where great horror never dies. In addition to serving as the host of the series, Karloff also starred in five episodes. Episode 10 Season 1 He plays a fake medalist in the prediction. He plays Stapleton's friend and protector Dr. Thorne, in the premature burial. In the last of the Somervilles he plays the amorous Dr. Farnham. Dialogues with Death is episode 11 from season 2. It was first aired on December 4, 1961. In this episode Boris plays two parts. In The Incredible Dr. Marcus and Karloff plays the lead as Dr. Conrad Marcuson. An eccentric man living alone in a decaying mansion. During the run of Thriller, Karloff lent his name and likeness to a comic book for Gold Key Comics based upon the series. After Thriller was cancelled, the comic was retitled Boris Karloff's Tales of Mystery. Born William Henry Pratt Karloff acted in 80 movies before being cast by James Whale in Frankenstein in 1931. Karloff and his daughter Sarah Jane had a lifelong, strong father-daughter bond. According to Sarah Jane, her father was the antithesis of the part he played in the 1931 classic horror movie, Frankenstein. He was, she says, the funniest, gentlest, kindest, quietest and most articulate English gentleman that ever lived. The Boris Karloff Bela Lugosi rivalry is well known to fans of classic horror movies, particularly the Frankenstein and Dracula franchises in the early era of movies with sound. Nevertheless, they starred in many horror movies together. Between Lugosi and Karloff, Lugosi brought more authenticity to his portrayal of Dracula. Although he wasn't from Transylvania, he was Hungarian, which is pretty darn close. For Lugosi it was his role as Dracula in the 1922 Broadway stage production that ignited his acting career. Lugosi was in fact offered the part of Frankenstein in the 1931 film. When he turned it down the director, James Whale, chose Karloff for the part. This was in fact Karloff's 81st film. But in reality, this was the beginning for Karloff. Frankenstein was the part that rolled out the red carpet for Karloff. Nevertheless, he also appeared in many other movies, television shows, Broadway plays, and radio shows. Boris Karloff's thriller series is among the most renowned of his television work. Without question, fans consider the series to have been well ahead of its day. The thriller series ran for two seasons and 67 episodes were made in total. The prediction is episode 10 from season 1. In the prediction Boris Karloff plays Clayton Mace, a fake mentalist who puts on shows seeing into the future of his audience. While Mace has an impressive crystal ball with a kind of disco ball inside, he and everyone else knows this is all about entertainment. The Irish actress Audrey Dalton plays Clayton Mace's beautiful harp playing sidekick in the show. Burmese-born British actor, Abraham Isaac Sofair plays the owner of the club and good friend of his best act, Clayton Mace. However, one night, he predicts that a boxer called Tommy Timms is going to die in a fight that very night. And the weird thing is, he does. This leaves the rest of the stage crew nervous. And Clayton Mace very confused. Without doubt, this is another great thriller episode. Enjoy the show.
What would you say, ladies and gentlemen, if I were to tell you that there is a dimension where time is neither dead nor unborn? A psychic plane where each moment lives for the eternal now. Would you scoff if I were to assure you that the past and the future can be revealed to us merely by attuning our minds to the In the car by the stage door. I see some skeptical smiles already. Well, my friends, no need to be self-conscious about your doubts. Man has always rejected that which he cannot fully comprehend. But I challenge you to refute the predictions of Nostradamus or to deny that down through the ages, every major event has been foretold by someone. A pagan priest, an oracle, an astrologer, or just some simple man whose mind is responsive to the vibrations of the cosmos. Coincidence, you say? <laughs> I think not, my friends. And I propose tonight, ladies and gentlemen, with your permission, to reveal to you some of the remarkable occult powers which lie at the very threshold of man's knowledge. A young woman in the audience wishes to know if her engagement ring is genuine. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me put it this way, madam. Your diamond is as genuine as your fiancé's offer of marriage. He ain't got to make a four-flusher out of me. Hey, you up there. I paid 200 quid for that ring she's wearing, and I can prove it, see? 200 pounds, sir. Well, in that case, your marriage to the young lady should be 200 times prospered. That is, if your arithmetic is correct. <laughs> All right, smart Alec. If you're so clever, look into your crystal ball and tell us who's going to win the main event at the Boxing Palace tonight. The main event of the Boxing Palace tonight. Ah, sir, there you have me. You see, it is quite obvious that neither the spectators nor the fighters will exert enough mental pressure to have the slightest effect upon the psychic plane. <laughs> they do not misunderstand me, ladies and gentlemen. I have no desire to demean the ancient and honorable profession of prize fighting which has always been, always. Death. I see death. Someone will die in that fight. Stop the fight, stop it, stop it. Stop it, stop the fight. <laughs> had a most terrifying experience. You see, his business is pretending to be clairvoyant. But the glimpse he just had into the future was true, as sure as my name is Boris Karloff. Imagine, if you will, the plight of a man who finds his premonitions concerning those he loves coming true. 
in the most horrible and violent ways. The name of our play is The Prediction, and appearing with me are Miss Audrey Dalton, Mr. Alex Dabia, Mr. Abram Safair, Mr. Adam Caillou, and Mr. Verbin Bai. Let me assure you, my friends, this is a thriller. <laughs> Hey, what are you trying to do? Get us fired? Leave him alone. I'll let him alone. I'll pull you right out of his tired old hat. Oh, stop it. Can't you see he's ill? Go away. You show some respect for your father, young lady. No, he not I frightened you. I'm sorry. You had a nasty fall, Clay. Just lie still. What? No, no. No. I was kept in that boxing arena. You're going to your dressing room to lie down. Let me alone. I'm... Give me a hand, boys. I'm all right, I said. No, let me alone. I've got to go. I'm all right, I tell you. Come on, you created enough to Let me alone. I'm all night. right, I tell Hold it, Charles. Yeah, I'm like weak in the head. But don't be a fool. I saw a man being killed. I saw it happen. Yeah, we all saw it. Terrible, wasn't it? Burton, I'm not out of my head. That boxer, his name is... Tommy Timms will die in the ring unless I stop that fight. Come on, you talk it over in your dressing room. Phone for a doctor. You don't believe me? Well, sure I believe you. And I'm going right over to the arena and tell Tommy's manager. You know his manager? He ought to. He's lost enough money back in Gunnar Gogan's tired fighters. But go to him. Say to him that... No, I'll... We'll both go after you've had a little rest. No, no. That boy will die in the ring unless I stop that fight. Dad, I think Clay really means it. All right. All right. I'll go over and tell Tommy's manager. Don't fail me, Bert. Look, go to your dressing room and lie down and leave everything to me, right? Right. <laughs> The old phony's got himself believing his own act. Loyalty. That's what I like about you, Burton. Loyalty. Ah, it never fails. Every time I leap... Okay. Every time I leave the theater, something happens. I tried to tell him that Ern was dangerous, but he wouldn't listen. Now I'm going to have trouble with the fire inspector. All right, how is he, Noreen? The doctor says it isn't serious. <laughs> That's all I need. Business is terrible. Now my star attraction is laid up. Gus, I said he'd be all right. I'm going to see for myself. Later. You've got something to do, remember? You think we should do that now? What's more important than ever? He's shaken, he's frightened. He needs to know how we really feel about him. Give me 20 minutes, huh? Everything should be ready in the kitchen. If it isn't, I'll fire the whole staff. Maybe I should already. <laughs> They're leading me into bankruptcy. Feeling better? Did your father go to the boxing arena? Yes. How do you feel? Oh, I'm all right, I think. I made quite an exhibition of myself, I'm afraid. The act needed a new finale. Gus will be furious. Gus will be Gus. Noreen, I never made any pretense about the act. It's entertainment, nothing else. I know people are intrigued by thinking they can get a peek into the future. But deep down in their hearts, they, they know it's just a harmless sham. Just like this beard that I wear in the act. Don't talk about it now, Clay. Have to talk about it. I don't know what happened out there tonight. Was it self-hypnosis or something else, something beyond my control? I don't follow boxing events. How did I know the name of that fighter? 
You probably saw it on a billboard or read it in the newspapers. You forgot it until that man in the audience mentioned boxing and then your imagination did the rest. I wonder. I know. You're just tired. You've often said yourself, and I quote, a suggestion presented to a fatigued mind can sometimes have alarming results, unquote. Do I really sound as pompous as all that? You sound perfect, always. Now, you finish taking off your makeup, and I'm going to go repair my lipstick. I'll be back for you in a jiffy. Where are we going? Look into your crystal ball, Mr. Mace. It's all there. In the dimension where time is neither dead nor unborn, but where each moment lives in the eternal now. Says this is one day I will never forget, and for more than one reason. <laughs> <laughs> what you gonna give us for an encore, Clay? He said fire to a stage manager, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Doreen, have I got to cut your beautiful cake? Well, here goes. There. Ah. <laughs> no, but seriously, a mere thank you is quite inadequate for what I really feel. What can I say? I say everybody have a good time on Kaskostopinos. Everybody have a good time. And Nori, music, please. And please, please, people, uh, don't, don't break up the place too much. <laughs> <laughs> Father isn't around. I made sure before I crashed the party. You mustn't stay. He just went to the boxing room. He'll be back any minute. Good. Then I can have it out with him. It won't do any good. He'll just make it impossible for me to see you. Why? I'm not such a bad cat. I'm reasonably presentable. I may even have a future of sorts for the right girl to keep my house and uh, have my kid. Oh, Grant, please. Maureen, I'm tired of having to dodge your father. I want to marry you. And I want to say yes, but... I know. If you ever got the courage to lead a life of your own, your father would have to find another meal ticket. Don't ever say that again. It's true. And you know it. You'd better leave. It's not fair. I can't go on like this and I can't end it. I love you, Noreen. I have to hit out at it and stands between us. I understand, darling. Just be patient for a little while longer. All right. We'll settle it when I get back from Edinburgh next week, OK? Grant, please leave. All right, all right, I'll go. But this is the last time I run for cover. Who's that? Just someone who asked me to dance. You're drunk. Where did you get the money this time? Oh, your old dad's still got a trick or two left off his sleeve. You better not let Gus see you like this. Clay won't stop him from throwing you out this time. He will if he wants to keep you in the hit. When you do things like this, I could... You could what? Nothing. That's better. You just remember to keep a civil tongue in your head, my girl. You do exactly what I say. When I say, understand? Noreen, you're crying. What happened? <laughs> Did your father say something to hurt you? It doesn't matter. He didn't mean to. Oh, he never means to, but he always does. Well, it's got to start. Oh, please, Clay, don't start anything. He's drunk. Drunk? I wonder where he weaseled the money from this time. Well, I'm through protecting him, Noreen. Finished. There's been enough trouble, Clay. I, I couldn't take any more. 
Clay, you better come out front. You go to your room, dear. There he is, the old geezer. He's the one who said it. He says that you predicted me by Tommy would get killed tonight. Are you his manager? I was. I'm sorry. You should have heeded my warning. You never warned us. You never intended to. Only boy is dead, and I've come to see what kind of a man would turn a prophet on a thing so terrible. Prophet? I don't know what you're talking about. Don't. Don't try to deny it. I do deny it. Why, you filthy devil, do you think I wouldn't know it? It's all over the streets. Everybody knows it. And you sent your flunky out to bet money on me boy's death. Look at him. The truth's like dirt on his face. Oh, there must be some mistake. Liar! Filthy liar! Oh, no! You big ape, he's telling you the truth! And Burton out to warn you, we all heard him. Burton! Where is Burton? I'll find him. Charlie, why did you tell him? Why not? Don't you see? A man as distraught as he is isn't responsible for his actions. If he finds Burton... I just hope I'm there. <laughs> How about that, eh? You have some of this stuff to you. I want to talk to you. All right, talk then. Alone, if you don't mind. This lady can hear anything you've got to say, Mace. If you please, this is private. Sure, Ducky. I don't mind. You, you stay right here with me. Bertie, dear. You wouldn't stop a girl from powdering her nose, would you? Then let go of my arm like a good chap, eh? Well, all right. Honey, come right back, see? I never could resist a masterful man. Why did you do it? I... I tried to get to the gunner. I, I tried to warn him, like you said, but the, the copper on the door wouldn't let me into the fighter's locker room. You're lying. I'm telling you what happened. How much did you win? Well, nothing. You can't bet on the fights when you're broke. Well, all right, I made a few quid. Well, all right. So, so what's wrong with someone trying to get a bit of good out of your hunch? They wouldn't let me see the gunner, so I, I did the next best thing. All right, I, I didn't kill the boy. If anyone's to blame, it's you. Well, all right, you think what you really well like. But I'm warning you, if you tell my daughter... If you don't stop trying to undermine me, I'll... I... Will what? You'll see, Mr... Mr... Tired Mighty. Come on, let's get out of here. Burton. Burton, don't leave. Don't go. Don't leave with that money, I warn you. You go and hang yourself, Mace. Burton! Burton! Charlie, stop him, stop him, I said. Oh, Burton, why? Something is going to happen. Ah, he's a big boy. He can take care of himself. We shall see. How about a... How about a little kiss, eh? Aren't you the forceful one, now? Well, it, uh... Can't do any harm, can it, eh? Not it on the street, ducks. A girl's got to mind her reputation. Reputation? Well, that's a fine one. It's not that I grudge you a kiss, Bertie. It's just I do like a little privacy. There's a cosy hole. Well, what are we waiting for, eh? Come on, then. <laughs> Now, 
play, really. It's the gospel truth, I tell you. Just as the train was pulling into the station, one with a hearing aid said, isn't this Wembley? And the other one who'd been dozing said, no, I think it's Thursday. So the first one said, well, so am I. Let's get off the train and have a drink. Oh, that's awful. The awful truth. Clay, ever since we got here, you've been trying so hard to amuse me. Why? Do you mean I've been talking too much? Certain sign of old age. Or worry. It's Dad, isn't it? Did Gus notice he'd been drinking tonight? Clay! Clay, what's the matter? You had better come quickly. Something has happened to your father. Where is he? Up the street. Aren't you coming? There's nothing I can do. I know what's happened. Make way, please. Make way. Make way. I've even... I was even going to have the river dragged. Why? How was I to know that you weren't going to do something crazy, huh? After your warning to Burton and what happened in that alley? Well, you... I was worried, Clay. You know how I am. Ah, but you're all right now. You're going to be sensible, I'm sure. I've been walking the streets all night, Gus, trying to understand this thing that has happened to me. To me, of all people. There's only one answer. Now, you need a change of pace. Why not rework the act? Dream up some new stunts. Well, I didn't find the answer, but the thought kept growing on me. Maybe I was responsible for Burton's death. Nonsense. It was Gunnar Gogan. The police have already arrested him. Gogan is innocent, but I wonder if I am. Stop it, Clay. You're not playing to an audience here. Gus, did I foresee Burton's death, or did I will it to happen? I could have had a motive. You know there was always friction between us because of the way he treated Noreen. Maybe I wanted him dead. You think you're the only one who hated his guts? That's no kind of logic. I must go to the police. Gogan is innocent. No, no, that's not clever. The newspapers will get hold of the story. You'll be hounded by every crackpot who wants to, to peer into his future. Burton was lured into that alley by a woman, Helen Tate. She'll reveal the name of her accomplice as soon as she's apprehended. Sure, sure. Now, why don't I phone the police anonymously, huh? You? Oh, Clay, you can trust me. After what happened to Burton, I'm not going to cross you. I know you won't, old friend. Taxi lady. Mm. A whole week without you. It's been an eternity. Mm -mm. First, tell me about your trip. You start at the beginning and don't leave out a thing. Well, the beginning and the end is I got the job I went after. Oh, Grand, that's wonderful. <laughs> I start at the Edinburgh office next week. Darling, you're coming with me. We can drive up to Scotland tomorrow night and be married in a little church I know, just near Edinburgh. We'll have six whole days to ourselves before I have to start earning a living for us. Well, you want to marry me, don't you? Yes, I... Well, then what's wrong? I almost thought the girl cried and got all silly and sentimental when the boy popped the question. I don't mean to spoil it for you, Grant. I... Well, then, for gosh sake, say yes and put me out of my misery. Noreen. 
Your father's dead. And if Mace is the kind of guy he says he is, he'll be the first one to give his blessing. I can't leave him yet. Why not? He's ill. It's more serious than he'll admit. He needs me. So do I. Grant, don't force me to make that kind of choice. Listen, Noreen, if Mace is really sick, he shouldn't be working. He needs a rest, a forced vacation if necessary. We could, he could break in a new partner while he's resting. Noreen, Noreen, you just can't say no. Gosh, you had me scared. Grant, I'll tell him tonight, after the show. What? No, no, that's the only way. I can't just walk out on him. What if he says no? He won't. Trust me. Now, I must go. You know something? What? You're going to be a very shrewish wife. Do you want to back out? I haven't gotten sense. Come in. Fifteen minutes, Mr. Mace. Thank you. How is he? Gus! Now he's looking through the walls. You'd keep that kind of talk for yourself. Look, he's been spooking up the place ever since Burton got it. Everybody's getting jumpy. You'd better do something, Gus. Gus! I'll talk to you later. How are you feeling tonight, Clay? Oh, I'm all right, thanks. Ah, that's fine. Why, we got a big house tonight. A champagne and caviar crowd. You will put a little extra schmaltz into the act, won't you? Well, <laughs> I don't mean you should make any predictions. Yeah, well, uh, I must get out front. Gus. Yes? Do you know a man named Harcourt? Harcourt, no. You will. Don't cross the stage to meet him. Sure, sure. I'll remember. <laughs> He's here, I'll tell him. Yeah. Gus. Shh, Gus. Somebody in your office wants to see you. A fella named Harcourt. Who? Harcourt? What's wrong, Gus? Gus! Yes, Clay. Smoke. You weren't killed, Gus. It's a miracle I don't fire the whole lot of the stage crew. Who did that rigging off stage? Don't blame the crew for what happened, Gus. Clear out, all of you. Go on. Clear out. There are customers out in front. Charlie, put the next act on. That's you, Clay. Oh. Oh. It figured you'd wait until the roof fell in on your head. Now will you get a new headline act? I've already got the best one in the business. Then tell your mentalist to stop spooking the crew. What are you talking about? He's been acting funny the last week. The crew don't like it. And fire them. Fire the lot of them. They talk like that. What do you want? Mr. Costopoulos? I'm Harcourt. Harcourt? I've been waiting in your office. I know. I'm from the Criminal Investigation Department, sir. Would you mind answering a few questions?
What about? Sometime last week, we received an anonymous phone call regarding Roscoe Burton's murder. The call was traced to this theater. Do either of you have any idea who made it? <laughs> we, we have half a dozen telephones in this theater, Mr. Harcourt. Yes. Well, I don't suppose it really matters. This is only a routine inquiry. We've already apprehended the killers. Killers? You mean Gunnar Gogan had an accomplice? Mr. Gogan has been released. Our anonymous tipster named this woman. I remember her. She was in the club the night of Clay's anniversary party. Helen Tate. She named an unemployed docker as her accomplice. They took about a hundred pounds from Burton's body. Are you sure you haven't any idea who made that call, Mr. Costopoulos? I said I didn't. Of course. Well, thank you for your trouble. Goodbye. All right, Gus. Now tell me that Mace didn't make that call. I say he didn't. You keep your mouth shut about that. We have enough trouble already. To reveal to you some of the remarkable occult powers that lie at the very threshold of man's knowledge. We have a lady inquiring about the whereabouts of her poodle, which has... He's off again. Let me get the curtain. His mind is a little blank. He'll be all right. There is a man, a young man in the audience named Dudley. Grant Dudley. Will you please identify yourself? Mr. Dudley, will you please come forward? Mr. Dudley, I know you're out there. Mr. Dudley. Dudley. Dudley! Dudley! I know you're out there. Mr. Dudley! Dudley, Dudley! Mr. Dudley! Let me, get hands, Gus. Let me get the curtain. Let me get him off. Dudley! All right, get him off. your message. How is Mace this morning? Not so good. Gus hired a new headline act. Tonight is our last performance. Oh, I'm sorry. No. No, I'm not sorry. That was a cheap trick he pulled last night. I read the ending in the morning papers. Grant, that wasn't a trick. Don't come off it, Maureen. He's no better than your father was. He'll do anything to stop you from leaving him. Including getting sacked? Publicity never hurt an actor. Grant, I tell you, he saw something. What? A flaming crash off the highway? Or maybe he saw us skidding off a cliff or tumbling off a oh, bridge? Stop it. Sure, sure. Just tell me if you're still coming with me tonight. I can't. Grant, I can't. He needs me more than ever now. He's ill. Noreen, if you don't break away now, you never will. He'll always find a way to hold you. That's not true. Clay could never deny me anything he thought I really wanted. Well, how did he know about you, Grant? I never mentioned your name. He knew nothing about us. I imagine he has ways of checking on you. That's unworthy of you, Grant. Noreen. Noreen, I got a wire from the firm this morning. They've changed my assignment. I have to report to the Rome office by the end of the week. To Rome? I'm driving to Dover tonight and getting the ferry boat to Calais. 
Will you come? Wait here. says you don't know about us. I don't believe it. I want to marry her, and I want you to say it's all right. You love each other? Yes. Then you must marry. You mean she has your blessing? My dear young man, I have no right to withhold my consent to anything Noreen wants to do. Then tell her that prediction you made last night was, shall we say, a mistake? Can't do that. Oh. So that's it. You won't stop her from doing anything she wants. You'll just keep her brainwashed so that you can do her thinking. Well, I'm taking her with me tonight, Mace. Prediction or no prediction. Then you must accept the consequence. I'll accept anything that happens. Just don't try any more of your cheap tricks. Dudley. I promise you I'll. I won't try to influence Noreen in any way, but in return, you must promise me something. What? Promise me that you'll turn back immediately if you... if you see a twisted sign. A twisted sign? A signpost with the legend... Edinburgh, 50 miles. You've got a bargain, Mr. Mace. Settled. He's given his permission. Well, go and ask him if you don't believe me. He asked me if we loved each other. I said yes. So he said we should get married. What could be plainer than that? Oh, Grant, that's wonderful. Hey. Hey, there's a law against setting fire to a public place. Coward. Oh, am I going to teach you a lesson? Well, come on, come on. I've got to pack. And you've got to do whatever brides are supposed to do before they're whisked away in the night. What about Clay's prediction? Forget it. Now, what did he say? Nothing. What did he say? All right. He made me promise to turn back if we see a signpost that says, Edinburgh, 50 miles. Well, don't you see it, honey? His predictions are phony. All right, all right. A mistake, then? He didn't know about my being transferred to the Rome office, unless you told him. I didn't tell him. Well, that proves it, then. Edinburgh is 300 miles to the north. We're driving south tonight. We're not going to be anywhere near Edinburgh. Come on. Now, now, now. Tears on your wedding day? Oh, Noreen is a fine young man. I like him. He's a fighter. He certainly gave me a taste of his determination this morning. Clay. Now, I don't want to hear any sentimental nonsense about your not wanting to leave me. My plans for the future don't include you, you know. As a matter of fact, I'm delighted to get you off my hands. But, Clay, what will you do? Take a long rest. Learn about a lot of things, perhaps. All day long, I've been torturing myself. Afraid you'd think me terribly ungrateful. Clay, I've been such a coward. I was so afraid to tell you about Grant. I'm afraid you'd think I loved you less. Five minutes, Mr. Mace. Shall we stand them on their ears, Miss Burton?
It's not right, Clay. We should have had a party for Noreen. Lots of presents and the cake. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Wedding parties are invented by caterers. All right, I admit it. All the same, it would have been decent to give her a nice send-off. What's the matter, Clay? You OK? I'd like to borrow your car. What for, Clay? Will I have it or not? Well, sure, sure, I'll drive you anywhere you want to go. Yes. You're meant to be there. Huh? Well, get your raincoat. Raincoat? Well, there isn't a cloud in the sky. I'll meet you out front. Hurry. before you left the theater? Nothing. Why? You're making noises like a lovesick female. I am lovesick. Grant! Whew. That was a close one. Hey. You look as though you're gonna pass out. Grant. Maybe we shouldn't go on. There's still time to go back to London Airport and get a plane. We're driving. Mace isn't going to spoil our first night together. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to snap at you. Tell you what. The first time we see a sign that says Edinburgh, 50 miles, I'll turn around so fast you'll think you're in a revolving door. OK? OK. <laughs> You'd better put a flare out, chum. I almost climbed over you. Oh, just that one, mister. I must have gone out. I'm sorry. Mono told me to stop at the next garage and send back a tow van. Glad to. 